Um, this is a very uh, brief, even though it seems long, introduction to the group for those uh, not so familiar is that the background for this is that we can use MRI to assess uh, both activity and damage in uh, arthritic diseases and uh, that it can actually also help in understanding disease pathogenesis and, and response to treatment. And it's actually now frequently used in outcome measures as an outcome measure in different, um, in different rheumatology clinical trials. And uh, this group has been quite important in this as we've been developing over the next, uh, the last, uh, even though it's a bit embarrassing, 20 years, uh, several uh, outcome measures uh, like uh, the one from, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, the remris, for psoriatic arthritis, for hand uh, osteoarthritis, a sump based osteoarthritis uh, score as well, heel enthesitis at the last uh, OMERACT, um, and also. Um, a um, digital overlay based scoring system uh, for MRI lesions of, of, in OA in the hip and knee. Um, so there is a different uh, different methods that has been developed and validated um, in our group. Um, and since 2018, since the last OMRACT, uh, we have mainly focused on um, more work with whole body MRI. We also had a system for that called WIPE, which I come back to, but now we have worked further with it. And uh, we have also been working with osteoarthritis of the hand and in the hip and knee in different studies. And that's the activities that we will present and discuss with you today. Um, so this was the introduction. Um, and I, we have uh, different speakers, facilitators, and, and rapporteurs. Um, I hope the rapporteurs will put down some notes on what we're we are doing and what will be said. Um, we will have a second. Uh, we will have a second session here now uh, on osteoarthritis, um, and I'll give the word to Philip in a minute. And then after that, we will focus on whole body MRI in uh, PSA and spondyloarthritis before we. Uh, wrap up in the end with plenty of time for discussions on the way. So, um, Philip, uh, if you would like to take over and introduce the OA session. Okay, osteoarthritis is a really uncommon disease and, and we've got lots of good therapies for it. So, there is virtually no reason to want to do osteoarthritis research. Okay, if you didn't understand that, we're in trouble. So we've got, um, let's go straight. Oyston, can you share your screen, I think? Yes, I'll stop sharing mine and then let Oyston take over. So much to do. One of the few therapeutic areas where we have less therapies than when I started in the field. It's, it's really good to be in this zone. So, Oyston, over to you, and uh, we'll just be watching the time uh, for all the presenters tonight because um, uh, we try to get finished on time if we can. That's the usual trouble we have every time we run a SIG face-to-face -face or online. Okay. Oyston, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear all, first of all, thank you for this uh, opportunity to present these findings on MRI gadolinium enhancement versus proton density MRI in hand OA. Gadolinium enhanced MRI detected synovitis is associated with pain and radiographic progression in the same joint in hand OA patients and has been suggested as an outcome measure in hand OA trials with drugs targeting inflammation. Age is the most common risk factor for hand OA and consequently hand OA trials might have a large proportion of older individuals with multimorbidity. Contraindications to gadolinium contrast includes previous allergic reaction to contrast agents and severe renal disease. Gadolinium contrast is generally considered to be safe. However, gadolinium deposits has been detected in basal cell ganglia, muscle, liver, and skin tissue, questioning whether repeated examinations might be harmful. Magnetic resonance of protons forms the basis of MRI, and these signals can be weighted to reflect the density of protons. Proton density weighted MRI images does not require a contrast agent and can distinguish between fluid and cartilage in joints. Our main objective in this project was to assess if proton density uh, weighted MRI and gadolinium enhanced MRI can be used to reliably assess synovitis in hand away patients. 
Secondly, we wanted to explore if findings on proton density weighted MRI agree with findings on gadolinium enhanced MRI in hand OA patients. We included participants from the NORHAND study, a hand OA cohort with 300 patients aged 40 to 70 with confirmed hand OA in at least one joint on ultrasound or clinical examination. They performed MRI of the dominant hand after IV administration of gadolinium contrast and a T1-weighted volumetric interpolated breath hold examination was reconstructed into sagittal and axial planes with 0.4 millimeter thickness. For proton density weighted images, we only assessed axial images with 2.5 millimeter thickness in the finger joints, while both axial and coronal images were assessed in the thumb base. We prepared an atlas with examples of synovitis grade 0 to 3 in DIP and PIP joints in gadolinium enhanced MRI in axial and sagittal planes and proton density weighted MRI in axial planes. Examples included joints where PD and GD had the same score, although we did not know before the exercise whether these scores actually corresponded. To the right is an example from the atlas with grade 3 synovitis in a PIP joint, and uh, for the thumb base, we applied the post gadolinium T1 images and T2 images from the TOMS atlas. A calibration exercise with 7 readers and 10 images was arranged, and after the first exercise, two rheumatologists and one PhD student proceeded with a reliability exercise. After the first reliability exercise, we obtained relatively poor results, and uh, we then um, discussed joints with grades 0 and 1, and also all joints with a difference of two or more grades. And we then proceeded with a new reliability exercise with 20 patients. Moving on to the results, we calculated mean sum scores of synovitis for all joints together and for the different joint groups for three readers, demonstrating numerically more enhancement in the proton density images. Gadolinium enhanced MRI demonstrated very good reliability for all joints together and in the DIP joints, while PIP joints showed good reliability and the thumb base moderate reliability. In the proton density sequence, the reliability was overall fair, while the DIP joints demonstrated poor reliability. These findings are also reflected by the percent exact agreement being better for gadolinium enhanced images compared to proton density images for all joints and also when calculating for separate joint groups. When comparing gadolinium enhanced MRI with proton density MRI, a mean weighted kappa value was calculated for the three readers. We found poor agreement for all joints together and for the DIP and thumb base. PIP joints had fair agreement. When increasing the cutoff and assessing both grade 0 and 1 as grade 0, we found slightly improved values. However, the agreement remained poor. The proton Density sequence was more difficult to assess than the gadolinium enhanced images. This was primarily due to the discrepancy in slice thickness, causing information to be lost in the small finger joints in the PD sequence. Furthermore, the PD images were only assessed in the axial plane in the finger joints, while the GD images were assessed in two planes. To conclude, we found very good reliability between three readers for measuring synovitis with gadolinium enhanced MRI. Reliability for proton density weighted MRI in finger and thumb base was poor, and we also found poor agreement between gadolinium enhanced MRI and proton density weighted MRI. When increasing cutoff for MRI, agreement improved numerically but remained poor. Finally, I would like to say thank you to everyone who participated in the discussions in the reliability exercise and development of the ATLAS, and also the patients in the NORHAND study. Thank you. Western, thank you. What's the message for the next person who comes to you saying, I want to do a hand OA trial, and what should I use? Should I use GAD or not? I guess uh, we would continue using gadolinium unless you can get thinner slices for PD. And uh, yeah, maybe that would improve the, the validity of the exam. It's a problem and it's why some of the knee work, I think has shown slightly better, contrast still better, but, but slightly better uh, agreement is because they get more slices mm. and, and they have more to look at. But I think you've put your finger on it there. It is about resolution and everything, isn't it? And, and okay, so difficult. Okay, any questions on that?
topic because we will just take one or two. And remember, you can use the chat box for questions, folk, if you want to. Um, perhaps I'll move on then because we've got a fair bit to oh. cover. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Um, it, it's a very short point, uh, to Rob Lambert. Um, good work, thank you very much. Uh, with, it's re with regard to what you call mm. that spin echo sequence, so your echo is 31 milliseconds, and that's not proton density weighted. That's intermediate weighted. As soon as you can see contrast between fluid and highline cartilage, that's no longer PD. So you're, you're comparing intermediate weighting with GAD, and the work is excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hmm. Thanks, Rob. That's good. Okay, so Oyston, if you stop sharing now, yep. and then uh, Jacob, are you going to use the separate? You, can you just take over sharing? Uh, I'm actually, Walter. yeah, yeah. I'm actually presenting. Okay. Um, and Jacob is going to um, follow me with the remaining slides. So hopefully you can see. Yes, I, we can see yours now. That's good. Okay. So uh, we're going to discuss um, the evaluation of the scoring systems um, in the, the hip and knee. And that's uh, our group, um, various people from uh, around the, the world. Uh, so our first objective was to develop um, a tricompartmental overlay for semi-quantitative assessment of BML in the knee. And although we're working with osteoarthritis images, um, that's because they're readily available, uh, this is not intended just for osteoarthritis. So in the, um, as I summarize um, this work, um, this is based on the work of five readers, uh, one of whom is an OMARAC fellow. And these were 38 scans from the OAI data set um, with, um, uh, 38 cases, I should say, with two time points and a one-year interval, and they were selected to have some BML at at least one of those time points. And before we began the process of scoring and evaluating the scans, we um, had the readers undertake a, a validated calibration process. Now, in order to validate the method that we've developed, the knee inflammation MRI scoring system, we compared this with the current method, which is called MOX. The Kimris method is a slice-based method, and MOX is based on volume. Um, we evaluate uh, bone marrow lesions uh, on a dichotomous basis, in segments, as you can see on the diagram, uh, MOX evaluates bone marrow lesions according to the percentage of one of 15 regions um, affected with uh, bone marrow lesions. Scoring ranges are very different, as you can see there. And um, what we found when we attempted to incorporate calibration activities for the for MOX is that there was very little that was actually available. And so we built from scratch a, an online interface for scoring MOX. And we also, as you can see, the schematic is available there. And we also designed from scratch a scoring uh, overlay um, to define the different regions in MOX. And so we proceeded with a real-time iterative calibration process. And you see the bone marrow edema lesion in the upper diagram. And if you were to click that lesion with your mouse online, it would change color. And so those regions are pre-scored. And so the reader conducting calibration aims for a pre-specified ICC target uh, for status scores of 0.8 and 0.7 for chain scores. So that's what has to be accomplished on 20 cases before a reader is considered to be calibrated. Um, so there are the demographics of our patient populations, a fairly typical patient population. 
This is what our descriptive data looks like for the MOX and the Chimeris for BML and Sinovitis effusion. I don't have time to discuss the Sinovitis effusion score. That'll have to be for the manuscript. Um, so what you see there is the change that's documented. Uh, we also show the smallest detectable change and the percentage of the maximum scoring range. The standardized response mean, the p-values, and you see that for detection of change, um, there is some evidence of uh, responsiveness using the Kimris method. And similarly, for synovitis uh, effusion. This is a summary of our uh, ICC scores, intra-observer ICC scores. Uh, the green is what is desired. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for status scores, an ICC cutoff of greater or equal to 0.8. And you can see with the Kimris, this was accomplished by several reader pairs for status scores. For change scores, for every, almost every single reader pair achieved um, the cutoff, the pre-specified cutoff. To some degree, also for MOX, uh, this was also accomplished. But uh, I hope you'll agree these are very good chain scores, uh, at reliability data for the very small amount of change that was evident. Similarly, for the Sinovitis effusion scores, um, cutoffs accomplished for both uh, baseline uh, ICC as well as change ICC. And despite the, the small degree of change over the one year time interval of these scans. This is cumulative probability plot data uh, for each individual reader for chain scores. You want these curves to be very, very tight. And you can see that they are indeed very, very tight, including uh, for the chain scores. So finally, uh, we conducted a feasibility evaluation. This was conducted using the system usability scale. It's a 34-year-old instrument. It's used by the US government. There are over 1,000 publications with it and 220 million hits if you Google it. And it's uh, an assessment of the usability, feasibility um, of an instrument and you want to aim for a score of over 68, which is considered to be um, sort of an average value. Um, so we implemented this and you can see the scores there. What I will point out is the enhancement of the reading of MOOCs with the online tools that we developed de novo for MOOCs. Um, we had excellent reliability even for our inexperienced reader, our OMARAC fellow. And there's some suggestion uh, with the limited data that we have that Kimris may be a more responsive tool. I'll hand this over to Jacob now. Great, thanks, Walter. Um, so another uh, objective of our, uh, of our part of the SIG here was to look at uh, joint effusion and our goal is to develop and validate a quantitative method for assessment of effusion synovitis on fluid sensitive MRI sequences. So Kimris um, and MOX are using semi-quantitative scoring and this is uh, an attempt to be fully quantitative. The first technique that we've developed is a manual effusion quantification tool um, where the user draws uh, on every slice a loose region of interest around, <laughs> around the joint and uh, the bright pixels that represent fluid within that area are auto-selected by a thresholding tool. Um, and the tool that we developed also can exclude areas of bone marrow edema manually if those have become a problem. We've tested this and published this recently. Um, and uh, what we found is that uh, this technique, um, we tested it in the hip with 97 uh, hips, uh, two time points um, and two observers. We found that fluid volumes uh, in the hip uh, matched with what we had expected. So patients who were proceeding to steroid injection had almost twice as much fluid in their hip as the other side. Uh, we demonstrated that the effusions measure, the effusion volumes measured by this tool correlated significantly to uh, parameters such as uh, WOMAC stiffness and function and uh, the HOOS function score. 
the R values uh, are always in the kind of moderate range for joint effusion correlation um, as expected. And we found the reliability was, was very good, ICC in the range of uh, 0.96. I'll show you that on the next slide as well. Uh, from a point of, so, or on, on a subsequent slide, sorry, go back one, Walter, sorry. Um, the other point is that the feasibility of this tool was actually not bad. Um, it takes four minutes per hip for someone who's used to doing this um, to trace, uh, uh, so eight minutes per MRI to determine the amount of, uh, of fluid in the joint. So that's not suitable for routine clinical use, but certainly uh, for uh, as a gold standard in a clinical trial uh, would not be out of range. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, the next step is to go fully automated. And so uh, we're using artificial intelligence to um, attempt to completely automate the process of quantifying effusions. A convolutional neural network is mimicking a human expert approach. After some experimentation, what we found is that a two-stage network seems to work the best, where there's first um, a neural network which is designed to just find the femoral head on a hip MRI, and then a second network finds the uh, bright or fluid pixels around that femoral head. Um, and we have several different types uh, of neural networks that we were evaluating uh, for that work. And um, it measures the joint diffusion volume slice by slice. So on the next slide, um, here are some visually, you can see the results. Um, on the left is the, the left two, call, two panels are um, the, uh, uh, actually, there are, are two patients with uh, human gold standard, and you can see the blue pixels. They're quite small, I apologize for that, but you can see the blue pixels are joint effusion. The patient at the, the um, lower left has a very severe bone marrow edema in their femoral head, which needs to be uh, uh, excluded manually when you're doing it manually. Now, the, the approach of just using a neural network that does some thresholding works fine um, at the top right, but with the patient with the bone marrow edema um, gets confused. Uh, it's trying to exclude the femoral head, but it, it, the femoral neck still gets caught. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have some refinements to the neural network. A single plane network we found, um, that's the one on the left, top and bottom. And that tends to underestimate the fluid volume a little bit. The, the pictures on the right um, are multi-plane network, which creates a, a pseudo-sagittal reformat and works from two planes when it's estimating fluid volume. The one at the top right, I was quite happy with. The one at the top, at the lower right, um, I think is actually quite a good result as well in a very challenging case. So um, uh, numerically, what we found is that the uh, artificial intelligence uh, correlation uh, of fluid volumes to the human experts is, is very good, actually. We had ICCs of 0.87 to 0.89 for the best network, which is the multi-plane network. Um, but remember that uh, the manual assessment was, re reached, was reaching 0.96 to 0.97. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not happy until we are equivalent to the manual uh, assessment. If you look at the confidence intervals, we're still, the neural network is still significantly less. Um, it's very good, but it's still significantly poorer than the, than the human assessment. So this is a work in progress. Um, so what we found in, in this part of the work is that effusion quantification by a human expert seems to be a reasonable MRI gold standard for jo joint fluid volume, ICCs 0.96, 4 minutes per joint. Um, the neural network uh, approach uh, automating this is up and coming and doing very well, but still needs some refinement. We'd like to also extend these techniques, both of them, to um, the knees uh, using the osteoarthritis initiative data and uh, test whether the simpler effusion scores of HIMRIS and HIMRIS um, are effective versus the gold standard, and refine artificial intelligence to automatically measure joint effusions. Um, and as a bonus, I'd like to point out that the localization component, the first part of that artificial intelligence network, can be used to automatically determine where the femoral head is or in the knee, the, the femur or tibia, so that it would be able to automatically position the HIMRIS and HIMRIS overlays, saving a uh, saving human readers a step. So I think there's a lot of potential with artificial intelligence um, uh, helping us to quantify, uh, further quantify these findings of active inflammation. Um, thanks, Walter and Jacob. Um, maybe I can ask for some questions and I'm, I want to target, Charles, you've scored a lot of um, 
OA joints. Any comments? Um, I, I think the, the utility of, um, of, of these, there's two, there's two things. There's one is performance in terms of sensitivity to change, et cetera. And then there is, um, you, you know, convenience, usability, as you put it, convenience and, and cost and accessibility, et cetera. Um, and those are both good parameters to model around in clinical trials. You know, it's, it's usually not um, uh, access that's the problem, but in clinical practice, there, there's no, uh, you, you can't use, nobody knows MOOC. They can't use it unless there's some, there's some technique that's trainable uh, as, as, as Walter did or automated neural networks. Um, to, to get these things into the clinic is going to take those kinds of uh, maneuvers. Um, and then also we're still looking for um, improving sensitivity to change, accuracy, filtering out variations in technique that uh, might throw the expert reader off. Um, the expert reader is really good. The eye is really good at correcting for those sorts of things and computers have some difficulty, but maybe there are some advantages somewhere. That's, those are just general terms. Um, but I think we've been, we've been going for a long time trying to get at this. And uh, I think until we do, it's going to be hard to get some of the, the measures that we got at OMERACT into clinical use. You might recall, Philip, I don't know if you remember the first meeting way back in Glasgow. Michael, uh, maybe you remember we were talking about even coming up with something like RAMRIS. And then there was a question of, is there a need for a different scoring method that's really suited for clinicians? Um, of course, that didn't matter until, well, there were no treatments back then. Um, now it is becoming relevant that payers aren't paying for MRI. Um, but that aside, uh, the, the priorities are different in those two contexts. So, um, so I think that's worth looking at also in terms of how we optimize these methods. And just for the people who aren't common members of this group, um, our parameters within OMRAC have always been about clinical trials or clinical study. Right. Um, but, but there are spin-off concepts and things that are obviously much bigger for many of the, for many of the things. There's no real comparable group looking at the clinician. And I, again, when we're doing things for clinical trials, kind of ahead of the curve, usually because you don't need a method for identifying patients for applic applicable treatment and monitoring that treatment until there's a treatment and but you need those I think there's no doubt that ML methods that AI methods for quantification of x-rays will slowly filter into clinical practice I, I, I think that's that's my belief. we're hoping whether we're they, waiting for whether they years. help yeah but whether they help I think they'll help with systems that are overwhelmed where they don't have enough yes. radiologists to read the films um, I think they'll help with that but uh, there's a comment I'd like, there's a comment I'd like to make that I think might partially address what's just been said. Um, so our Omarat fellow had no instructions at all. We didn't even sit down and look at the scans with him before he started the exercise. And I think having the online interface and the real-time iterative calibration module which very precisely illustrates how the method is scored and provides real-time feedback in terms of concordance of scoring with expert readers, that can make an impact. And it can uh, be beneficial even for clinicians who want to understand the scoring and, and find ways of implementing this in clinical practice. But that's the sort of direction where I think we need to be going with, with these methodologies. The online interface and the real-time iterative calibration is something that I think really makes a difference. I agree. Yeah, that was my point, actually. That, that is, the, that is re where real impact could be made because these methods that we talk about and all of the trials use them, um, one thing is the clinicians, they see the name, but they don't really know what it is. And then to actually ap apply it in clinical practice. So in a clinical trial, you can't convince anybody that you actually have a structure modifying therapy unless you prove it this way. But then when they're in the clinic, you just, you just 
do joint counts. Uh, you, you can't, and you don't have a method for actually checking. And you can ask a radiologist, they've never heard of RAMRIS or don't know how to do it, or, or in OA, same thing. We don't have a treatment there yet, but the same thing will happen. So I think there's a real need to get these adapted and, and uh, accessible uh, to clinicians um, to move, the, move the, the ball further once a treatment has started to come into play. And that's been 15 years now for, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. One of the interesting feedback when I speak to pharma companies about therapies, and I must say this is the RA world, which is more advanced, as you say, Charles, has been what do clinicians think of MR? What do they understand is going on? And, and actually, it's quite a high bar because they don't know much at all is the answer and and it is something we have to think about Michael, and, and then they me. don't use it and it's a bit of a sour grapes because if you don't use it you don't want to say i don't use something that's critical so you end up downplaying it and it, it's a vicious cycle so i think there is a lot to be gained by by developing these things so Michael, yeah. i'm watching the time any mm -hmm. other comments yes on, i just have oh, a question Andrea. about the calibration um because i just was noting uh, noticing the way uh, Mikio and, um, and Walter described the calibration process. Uh, in terms of the sample size, the ideal sample size for this calibration exercise, and then uh, how, are we going to get all the readers, I think, uh, that will participate in the real reliability study, or just we're going to select some? For example, Mikio out of seven, maybe just three were really did the study. And so I think this will be interesting to discuss this sample size calculation for that. Um. Well, for the, the real-time iterative calibration, that's, we set pre-specified targets for ICC. And this is intended for the calibration of individual readers. Are they ready to proceed with a formal reading exercise? The calibration is intended to help the reader to understand uh, you know, what is this, the, the type of lesion that, that reaches the, the threshold signal for calling it an inflammatory lesion, for example. So it sets the sensitivity threshold and it ensures that the individual reader understands the scoring method. And so it's a real time ICC progressive learning format. And then for the readers, well, we had readers in the study. We included all comers, and we're happy to include further readers from uh, the, the, the total sort of novice, who was our OMARAC fellow, all the way to our senior MSK radiologist, Rob Lambert. So those ICCs were based on, um, you know, people with a variety of uh, skills and experience. Mm -hmm. I could ask whether there were any uh, questions from, you could say, some of the, you could say, not that involved, like, for instance, a patient or methodologists uh, who are also in the call uh, around what has been done, or are you happy with the presentation and how it could be understood, that it was understandable? Uh, yes. I think it's quite easy to follow. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thanks to everybody for presenting. And now I might hand back to Miggle.